My name is Sam Pardew. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of Indo, uh, but also the founder of Clean Practice. And Clean Practice is a, a now an organization that has a number of volunteers who are uh, either lean experts or, uh, in the case of Amina, she's a, uh, a communication uh, expert who's helping us tell the story of what we're doing. And I guess, in a way, I'm one of the first users of clean practice. Uh, we developed the practice uh, at Indo, but um, it's been informed by the contributions of the people who are here on the screen. Context. Before I dive into uh, elements of clean practice, I think it's really important to some of the important just things that are happening right now. One thing that I think is really important to know is that COVID-19 is resurging and the pattern is likely to repeat. Actually, we're kind of on the downside of a, of a wave in the United States, uh, but uh, the best science predicts that there'll be uh, resurgences of the vaccine as we uh, periodically relax uh, our various uh, containment measures and then the uh, virus takes back off. We're probably 18 to 24 months away from uh, on the most aggressive schedules of a vaccine being deployed in enough of our population to uh, you know, completely uh, reduce uh, transmission rates. So we're going to be dealing with COVID-19 for a while. Uh, another very important fact that's not as well known is that 85% of hospitalized survivors suffer lasting health damage. So the death rates have come down but the damage rates are actually quite high. That, uh, that's a very scary number when you think about it. So damage to lungs, brain, uh, organs, uh, it's, uh, it's not something that uh, anybody wants to get. And so the net of this is we're likely to be balancing safety and economy for 18 to 24 months from now at least. And as at any moment during this pandemic, response speed and effectiveness remain critical. And just a few things to help organize our thoughts about COVID-19. There's a lot of information about the virus itself, but I think it's helpful to put some that data into some buckets. There's three key transmission vectors, human to surface to human, uh, infected person touches the light switch, somebody else touches that light switch. Uh, human to human, that's when somebody coughs or sneezes or maybe laughs or sings and the uh, virus spreads directly from their mouth onto the other person's face and infects them that way. And the third vector, which has emerged more recently, is the human to air to human uh, vector, where again, typically vocalizations or coughing or sneezing uh, aerosolizes viral particles. They can float in the air uh, or build up in concentration and spaces uh, which is a dangerous vector for spread. Of course, most people know now that 35% of infected individuals are asymptomatic, yet still contagious. And another really key point is that the intensity of exposure increases the risk of infection and the severity of infection. So our understanding of COVID-19 and our responses have changed as our understanding of the virus has changed. So people that may have been doing a superb job back in April may need to revisit what they're doing today. Our goals in this presentation are to empower people to create their organization's COVID-19 response plan, to lead that plan's implementation, to lead what we call a clean Gemba walk, and to identify and implement engineered solutions to try and eliminate COVID-19 vectors altogether. COVID-19, uh, there's a lot of information out there that says what you should do. OSHA has laundry lists of measures. State agencies have laundry lists of measures. Not many people are trying to help organizations understand how they should implement those measures for the best outcomes for their team. Clean practice is here to help. Uh, it uses lean techniques, but instead of addressing inefficiencies, it identifies and reduces or eliminates COVID-19 transmission vectors. There's no need to be a lean practitioner to be a great clean practitioner inside your organization. And But one of the key elements of lean that's foundational to lean that we're bringing into clean and really advocating for is that involvement of people at every level of your organization is key to the best outcomes for both safety and team morale. If you get everybody involved, then they're going to uh, follow guidelines better 
and they're going to identify problems and they're going to come up with better solutions than top-down mandates will. We think that there's a great return on the time invested. Doing clean practice doesn't cost any money at all. It just involves a little bit of time, but the return on time is really very good. Uh, you'll have a safer team. You're going to have significant improvements to your team morale because people will not be operating with fear. They'll be operating and focusing on your mission. And finally, it's actually an opportunity to strengthen your organizational culture. Every organization on planet Earth right now has to respond to COVID-19 one way or the other. If they respond really well, it can strengthen their organizational culture. If they respond poorly, it will erode trust and can contribute to a toxic workplace environment. So uh, we think that clean practice provides a way to engage your team and have a really better outcome than you might if you just kind of create a laundry list of measures that people need to do, post that, you know, and mandate that people follow those measures. And we'll get into that a little bit more when we get into some of the specific clean practices. Like any good lean program, we have specific quantitative goals. And in our case, we have very ambitious goals. Uh, we want to ha help organizations achieve zero COVID-19 transmissions in the workplace. And we would like to help you get to 100% workforce participation and satisfaction. And I actually think these two things are very tightly coupled. The more people in your organization that participate in your COVID-19 response, the happier they'll be, the more, but also the more involved they'll be in success and you'll have a safer team as well. With Clean Practice, we like to emphasize that the most vulnerable people in our organizations are the ones we really need to protect. And any organization in the United States that has more than 20 people uh, probably has uh, more than one person who falls into a very vulnerable category. Uh, age is clearly one of the most important factors. Uh, older people are much more at risk of having a severe uh, response to COVID-19. But there's a number of health conditions that people have that we're really beginning to just beginning to understand that can contribute to worse outcomes. So in any large organization, there's likely people uh, who have diabetes or asthma or heart conditions who are much more at risk of a severe COVID-19 uh, response. And we need to protect those people with our organization's response. So I talked about morale and I wanna share something that uh, happened at Indo, um, just to give you a little bit of a story. Uh, Indo's a clean tech manufacturing company based in Portland, Oregon. The Portland metro area was one of the first three communities in the United States where community transmission of COVID-19 was identified. And we jumped on this uh, problem really early. We were very proactive in our response. We developed a COVID-19 response plan and, and I presented it to our entire company on the morning of Monday, March 2nd, which was early in this whole crisis in the United States. And as a consequence, um, the team really appreciates uh, how proactively we've responded to COVID-19. You can see here a response to a survey we did uh, where our team responded very, very positively to uh, how we've handled the COVID-19 situation overall inside the company. And I will say that uh, the team's performance of our mission, uh, which is to drive you know, the company sales and, and to help people enjoy comfort and quiet and energy efficiency in their homes, um, has been better than ever during this crisis because uh, be, you know, the way we responded to COVID-19, uh, the team really appreciated it and we've had really great uh, execution on a lot of key deliverables and we're moving the company forward instead of falling backward. And so I'm really grateful that a proactive response has that positive impact on your team as a whole. So a few disclaimers before we get into the principles of clean practice. Uh, it's based on our understanding of lean and information on COVID-19 from CDC, the World Health Organization, and other uh, data-driven scientific sources. Uh, clean practice is not endorsed by the government, and it's only a guide uh, during this rapidly evolving crisis. And we do not guarantee eliminating the disease. Uh, there's a lot of risk factors, and you can do a fantastic job trying to mitigate uh, COVID-19 in your workplace and still have someone uh, spread um, the disease in your in your space. So with that, we'll move forward and talk about 
the 10 elements of clean practice, which many of them do come from lean. Uh, the first is it's really important for everybody to have a plan. Uh, we provide a COVID-19 action plan template on cleanpractice.org. Uh, we welcome comments on the template so that uh, we can continue to improve it. Uh, we've updated it a number of different times uh, over the course of the crisis as we've come to have a better understanding of COVID-19. Uh, a plan is necessary because you want to build trust uh, among your team. And without a plan, there's no way to get everybody kind of organized. Uh, we think, uh, and here is kind of a screenshot of what the template looks like right now. We think a great template, you know, you can just edit and replace and then optimize and kind of personalize uh, the template for your own organization. Uh, but a good plan uh, spells out your goals. It shares information on the disease itself. It shares information on how you're going to be responding within your organization. It tells employees what to do if they feel sick, it explains your paid time off policy. There's a number of elements to a good plan, uh, but it's important that you have that plan and that everybody in your organization knows that you've got a good plan to respond to this crisis. You need to share the plan. And I think that uh, from personal experience, it's really important that the senior most leaders of your organization present the plan. And uh, in, in that presentation of the plan, it's really important to move directly into action, into training. Uh, when we introduced uh, our COVID-19 uh, plan at Endo uh, on March 2nd, uh, I led a participatory uh, demonstration of effective hand washing. We just found the two team members who had their birthdays in closest proximity to that date and we sang them happy birthday one after the other, you know, singing happy birthday twice in a row is a great way to show people how long uh, you need to wash your hands to be very thoroughly removing the virus from your hands. Um, obviously, you want to use masks, social distancing, and excellent ventilation for the people who are on site. Uh, now, uh, a lot of team members at Endo are working remotely, so uh, we would do a company meeting with some people on site, but many people are working remote. Um, announcing zone captains, that's a concept we'll get to in just a moment. It's a great way to kick off the plan with action uh, right away. You're beginning to build the team of people who are going to help you respond. And, um, and again, emphasizing to everybody that clean practice or your COVID-19 response protects your most vulnerable teammates is something you want to keep hitting again and again because sometimes people look at this virus and they think about their own personal risk and they forget about how uh, they might endanger other people if they're not doing the right kind of behaviors inside of your organization. And the final point is you do want to ask for immediate changes to lifelong habits. I mean, people are not used to washing their hands. And they're not used to, you know, turning on light switches and opening doors with their elbows and forearms. But you want to ask people to start making those changes right away. Uh, so don't be afraid to ask. But building, um, you know, having the senior most members of the, of the organization present the plan is a great way to signal that we're all in this together. COVID-19 does not respect rank or seniority or any other kind of distinction. It's going um, to come after us all. Everybody participates. Um, and here, leaders immediately begin uh, demonstrating the best clean practices. Uh, you know, we have a sink in our kitchen, and when I'm in the office, I'm making sure to really demonstrate that I'm washing my hands really thoroughly. I'm not opening uh, doors with my hands anymore. I'm showing people uh, how it's done with my own every action. And I also recommend that senior most leaders participate in the daily f uh, facility sanitation. Uh, you know, uh, there's some organizations that are hiring cleaning services. But uh, we believe participation is a great way to get people involved in protecting each other. And it's very simple uh, with a good approach, a good planning approach to get everybody involved in facility cleaning, which is one way that they can help keep themselves and their peers safe. Using clean Gemba walks. Now, Gemba walk is a, um, it's a, Gemba is a Japanese word. A lot of lean practices really, you know, emerged and were solidified in Japan. And then they've come back over the United States and almost every manufacturing organization in the United States uses lean in some form. Uh, there's a number of different uh, approaches uh, within lean. 
and uh, that are used within clean. Uh, so lean is really a set of practices designed to get employees involved in identifying and solving problems. And uh, one of the techniques from lean that is particularly valuable for clean is what's called a gimbal walk. In a gimbal walk, uh, senior managers will walk through a space. If it's a factory, they might be walking through a part of the factory uh, production line, uh, perhaps with members of the team, uh, talking about issues that might be occurring in that area of the facility. And maybe you're looking for things that might be going wrong. For instance, in a production facility, sometimes inventory will build up where there's a bottleneck. So it helps you identify the bottleneck and talk through ways that you could relieve that bottleneck. In the case of clean, what we want to do is divide up your space into zones and create a map that identifies all the different zones. And a great source of a map might be your emergency exit plan. Every organization should have an emergency exit plan on file and probably posted around uh, the facility that shows where the emergency exits are. So we simply took that emergency exit plan and we scanned it, but we use it in a different way uh, because here we broke up our space into different zones based on the teams of people who are working in each space. So that green zone there, uh, that includes the break room, a couple bathrooms, uh, a stairwell, but also the accounting department and the operations team. Uh, we had a zone captain uh, from the operations group who volunteered to manage our COVID-19 response in that zone. And uh, this zone captain led a walk, a gimbal walk through that area, that office area, to identify risk factors. Now, a good Gimba walk will document the kinds of issues that you find. And so they were walking along with a clipboard, but they transcribed later into a Google Sheet uh, the, um, the issues that they observed. And as you go on this walk, uh, very simple, maybe in order to make sure you're very thorough, maybe you walk in a spiral. Uh, maybe you go clockwise because that's how clocks go and it feels natural, but you walk around the room and you're looking at every kind of surface and, and you're looking for surfaces where more than one set of hands touches that surface in any 72 hour period. You're looking for areas where people congregate together closely, uh, which might create social distancing issues uh, within your organization. And you're looking for places where air uh, could be stagnant and multiple people might be in that stagnant air space and that's an area that you really need to be concerned about uh, ventilating better. And, um, and we recommend that you actually can at this point as you're walking through uh, put down colored dots on all the surfaces that are going to need to have uh, a systematic cleaning approach. Uh, so pretty soon your uh, space We'll have multiple little colored dots uh, around it. Uh, we recommend that each zone uh, have its own color. This creates a sense of ownership and uh, you'll start to see um, where you need to uh, you know, address issues. So with social distancing, maybe you're using blue tape. With airflow, uh, maybe uh, there's not a really good way to uh, you know, visually mark where you have airflow problems, so you, but you're going to note where you have issues and really start to think about how you can resolve them. So Gemba Walks are a great way to get many different people in your team involved, right, in identifying what the problems are in their area and what are the possible solutions that they could have. But making sure that everything gets cleaned uh, is a really good one. And here is a, a template uh, for documenting uh, the cleaning schedule where you can identify all the locations in a room. Uh, you can have your cleaning schedule uh, you know, noted out and you can actually uh, assign someone to do the cleaning uh, of on a given day. So at Endo, I participated in the cleaning schedule. So I was, at the time I was working in the factory, I'm now working from home, uh, because that's the safest thing for the people who remain in the factory. Uh, when I was uh, there, I was actually going around and cleaning, and everybody saw me uh, cleaning uh, and participating in this process. And I think that was really, really helpful for team morale, uh, for everybody to know that we are all in this together. And it didn't take very much time at all, 
Uh, if you break up your uh, space into zones, then a, a cleaning schedule might only take 15 minutes to do. Uh, so it's a great way to assure people and calm people down. Now, visual management, visual factory is another lean technique. Here we're calling it visual management because we recognize that many non-manufacturing organizations are using clean. Visual management is, uh, in, in the case of a manufacturing company, you might use visual factory to color code uh, different uh, areas of your factory, to have visual explanations of how to do a manufacturing process, uh, to have uh, visual uh, ways to keep all of your tools organized and your inventory uh, kind of um, uh, well organized as well. In clean practice, there's a couple different ways to use visual management. Those little colored dots, you see here um, one of the indoor break rooms. Uh, we have these chartreuse dots that uh, are every surface that needs to be cleaned. And so you can start to see there's little dots uh, kind of all over the place uh, and also uh, engaging visual signs, uh, blue tape on the floors for social distancing. We think that an invisible enemy needs a visible response. And so these stickers are a great way to make sure that everybody knows that every surface is going to be cleaned uh, repeatedly, sometimes throughout the day, if it's a, a very continuously touched surface. It's a great way to reassure people and make them feel calmer and more confident in your organization's response. So they speak volumes. Um, but uh, that is the idea that you're going to have a better outcome from both the safety point of view, because all of these spots will get cleaned reliably, nothing will get missed. And secondly, people will feel confident uh, in what's being done and they'll know every time they walk through a space that there's a vigorous response going on. A great example of a sign, and this one's for, available for download off the cleanpractice.org website, is this one. It actually uh, has a quote from Dune, uh, the science fiction novel, uh, and it really speaks about fear, and because fear really is the mind killer. If your team is afraid, they're operating out of the very base of their brain. They're not operating in their creative and, and proactive space. And it's going to hurt their ability to achieve the mission of your organization. So, um, and, you know, reading through this, you actually will spend the right amount of time washing your hands. So we like using signs. Sometimes it's a good idea to rotate the signs, keep them fresh. It's a, it's a fun way to keep people involved and engaged. Plan, do, check, and act. So we mentioned that there was uh, on the Gimba walks that we had these cleaning schedules and we had all uh, different points uh, of the schedule uh, that needed to be clean listed. You can see here that um, we're posting these in a public space inside of the zone. Uh, this is the orange zone, so they have a different color sticker uh, that really shows that um, there is a good execution of uh, the cleaning practices. So plan. Uh, is creating and sharing your plan. Do is beginning implementation immediately. You don't want to post a plan and have days and days go by before you're actually implementing. Uh, we think you can begin implementing right away by uh, announcing your zone captains and doing your first Gimba walk on the day that you announce your, uh, your COVID-19 response plan. You want to do follow-up to check to make sure everybody is uh, doing the right things. And, um, Acting is really based on senior leaders demonstrating the best practices and ensuring that everybody is participating. Kaizen is another uh, term from Lean. It is very simple. It means continuous improvement. We think the idea of Kaizen is very important for uh, the COVID-19 response because COVID, our understanding of COVID is evolving. Uh, we've learned over the course of this pandemic here in the United States, first we were concerned about surfaces, the human to surface to human transmission vector. Later in the summer, we learned about the human to human transmission vector where, you know, all of a sudden it was the greatest concern was the coughing and spitting and sneezing directly onto somebody else. More recently, we've learned about the human to air to human transmission vector. If we weren't continuously updating our responses in our facility, uh, we would no longer have a good response and our team's confidence and our team's engagement would fall off. 
So we think uh, repeating the Gimba walks periodically um, is a great idea to keep your team involved, to identify new issues as we learn more things about COVID-19. Uh, during these Gimba walks, we also think it's a great idea to cross-pollinate and bring fresh ideas into each zone. So why not bring other people from other zones to do a Gimba walk uh, in, in different zones with each other? This brings fresh eyes, so maybe they see something uh, that you haven't seen, uh, and maybe they can share a great solution they came up with uh, over in the shipping department. They can share that uh, with somebody in accounting. So it's a great way. We always talk in organizations how we want to increase interdepartmental cooperation. And this is a great way to get people in your organization talking to each other. So think about it as a way not only to improve your COVID-19 response, but to get people in your organization talking to each other to improve relationships and to improve your organization's culture. Um, so stay current on COVID-19. Use that information to update your practices. Repeat your Gimba walks to make sure that uh, you are um, identifying the new threats based on our new understanding of the dangers. This is a great example of how we've reduced transmission vectors at Indo. Uh, wherever possible, you want to move beyond cleaning to eliminating the transmission vector altogether. Uh, here, uh, these are examples of door pulls that we uh, designed and invented and deployed at our facility to allow people to open up doors without touching them with their hands. Doors are one of the biggest culprits. You know, people thoughtlessly touch that door and then wipe their nose. They may have put themselves in danger. Uh, we can really uh, eliminate or dramatically reduce that risk if we allow people to open up the doors uh, without uh, touching them with their hands. In some cases in our facility, as you saw in that very, very early photograph, we've removed the doorknob altogether, which I guess is a form of pokey oak, uh, because you're, you're eliminating the ability to do the function wrong. Uh, you're uh, basically only allowing people to open up that door uh, with their forearms. So it really helps people uh, get it right every time. Um, you know, Training is another element of this. You really want people to not be turning on light switches uh, with their fingers. You want people to do that with their elbows wherever possible. You want to try and transition away from people touching things with their fingers uh, to using uh, parts of their body that, that they don't use to touch their face. Expand trust. Trust is such an important part of our response to COVID-19. We need to trust each other. Uh, we need to uh, count on each other to do the right things uh, and around the workplace and at home. And you can build trust by uh, your organizational policies. Uh, the better you can build trust, then the more your team is going to adhere to your COVID-19 policies, not only at your organization, but when they're at home. Uh, the more you build trust, the more that employees will stay home when they're feeling ill and, and you'll provide them with the trust that allows them to stay home without losing their jobs or losing their income. And that's really important right now. So at Endo, uh, we have emphasized that, uh, you know, sick employees coming to work are the most important vector to address. If people that were sick stayed home, uh, it really reduces the risks, although, you know, as we know, asymptomatic people can feel completely fine coming to work and still spread the disease, so uh, it doesn't eliminate the risk. Uh, but we do uh, recommend that people have generous sick leave policies right now. And an example is uh, this one here, which is that effective immediately, the company will allow employees to borrow up to 40 hours of earned time off to recover from respiratory illness after they've exhausted other PTO. Uh, another example that I think is really important right now is allowing employees to call in sick without requiring a doctor's note. Uh, if, you know, right now I think you don't want people going into the doctor's office to you know, get a note or something like that. Uh, but if you can trust your team and your team trusts you, uh, then you can implement this policy and successfully. And it really helps your team's morale. Accountability is uh, really important as well. 
uh, we want to communicate the status of your organization's uh, participation. When all the zone walks uh, or the gimbal walks have been completed, why not let everybody know, hey, we've all done it. We've all gotten our cleaning schedules implemented. Uh, that helps everybody kind of build their participation. Uh, I like at team meetings to ask for a show of hands. Uh, how many of you are wearing masks reliably outside of work to make sure that you're protecting other people and yourselves? And when I ask for that raise of hands, uh, well, guess what? Everybody raises their hands. Maybe not everybody's wearing their mask uh, responsibly, but what they see is they see everybody else is raising their hands, which is a kind of a social signal that this is the right thing to do. And it actually will help people follow the right uh, behavior patterns. How many of you are washing your hands for a full 20 seconds now? Uh, you know, ask everybody to raise their hands. And in that signal, that participation, that physical motion actually will commit people and help them uh, participate with a higher level of reliability. Again, leaders demonstrate the best practices. That's so critical here. Uh, and that, that involves, you know, this is where the cleaning comes in. This is where the participation comes in. And um, again and again, you want to emphasize that uh, participation by all employees uh, or team members enhances the safety of all team members. And um, that's what's really, really important here. Finally, growth. Uh, everybody wants to, uh, you know, grow this effort. If we all did the right things uh, inside of our organizations and if our organizations could become hubs of training people and encouraging the best practices around COVID-19, it could make up for some of the severe deficits we're seeing in the government's response. Uh, so the goal is that you want all team members to maintain really good practices, not only at work, but also at home. And you want to recruit more organizations to follow your leadership. And a great way to do that is, you know, a lot of team members these days uh, live in shared housing. Uh, so uh, my, uh, my direct sales manager lives in a house with four other people that don't work at Endo uh, because Portland, Oregon real estate prices are pretty expensive. So it's a great way for him to get his costs down. Um, he decided with his housemates, because they all work in different organizations, that they were going to have a cleaning schedule and they were going to identify the surface areas that were the riskiest ones in their home uh, that needed to be cleaned regularly, that people needed to be careful about handling. Uh, so they actually deployed the DOT system uh, in their home as well, and they have a cleaning schedule there, which is great. And members of that organization that uh, work in organizations that don't have, or sorry, members of that household, uh, that uh, work in organizations that don't have great COVID-19 response policies uh, can advocate uh, for uh, their organizations to do a good job uh, simply by bringing in a copy of the COVID-19 uh, template plan uh, that we're sharing at the cleanpractice.org website. So those are the 10 elements of clean practice. Um, if there's any questions, I could look for them. Uh, you can add, add them into chat. Uh, but otherwise, I'm going to continue going with a little bit of a discussion about workplace social distancing. Uh, kind of in that previous section, we, we showed some examples of how you address uh, human to surface to human uh, transmission. Now we're going to show some ways to reduce the dangers of human to human transmission through so social distancing. Uh, key elements of workplace social distancing is that everyone wears masks. Uh, you want to minimize uh, the number of people who are actually at the workplace. So at Endo, uh, we have our production team and a couple essential workers are still at the office, uh, but the rest of the office workers are now working remote. And uh, we've been able to maintain great continuity of operations. Uh, I'm going into the office about once a week uh, for meetings and to check in with everybody who's physically there. Uh, but I'm very careful uh, when I'm in the workplace and everybody knows that because we don't want uh, me or anybody else who's coming to visit the factory to become a transmission vector and bring the virus in. So um, you want to maximize the spacing. Uh, you want to have a minimum of six feet apart. Now, six feet uh, will reduce the spit kind of uh, direct exposure that you get. It doesn't completely eliminate it, though, because of the aerosolization. So you really want to maximize spacing the minimum of six feet. 
You want to limit headcount in common areas. It's great to uh, reduce meetings or meet outside whenever possible. You want to use physical limiters and separators. Stagger your shifts and breaks so people are not overcrowding break areas with too much density. Uh, and it's a great idea to allow paid time before and after breaks for hand washing. So on the clock, let people wash their hands. You don't want people to be frustrated because there's not enough time to wash their hands uh, during the break because there's a line, a long line at the sink, right? So let people do that uh, before they go on their uh, paid break. Now some good images. Um, this is from a not uh, Indo, a different manufacturing company, courtesy of the Oregon Manufacturing Extension Program. It shows how this organization used blue tape to really keep people, um, you know, remind them of the separation that they need to maintain uh, while they're on this uh, this assembly line here. Um, limiting headcounts to common areas. A great way to do that is to remove enough chairs so that you can maintain social distancing, and it's not possible for more people. Uh, to sit down around this conference table. Uh, so that's a great idea to use. Uh, meeting outside and reducing the number of meetings is a fantastic idea as long as the weather allows. Um, at outside, you've got uh, more room to spread out, and also it helps with the uh, aerosolization issues. Uh, physical separators and limiters can uh, help prevent uh, the transmission. Here at the bottom, you see those conference Tape, uh, chairs that were taken out of circulation in that conference room were taped off uh, so that people really knew that they could not use those chairs uh, and overcrowd that space. Um, so those are great examples of how people are doing social distancing. Um, you know, every space is going to be different depending on the configuration of that space. Managing airflow is the, the most recent frontier and it's maybe the trickiest one to do, uh, but there are some approaches that we can share that um, you can look at. When you're doing a Gemba walk, you can look uh, for uh, spaces that could be problematic. Now, I kind of recommend people use this imaginary Geiger counter because the idea of intensity of exposure is really important here. Uh, the bigger of an exposure you get to COVID-19, the greater your risk of getting sick and the greater your risk of having a severe uh, outcome. It's kind of like if you get a really big exposure at the beginning, your immune system has to play catch up and maybe it never catches up uh, to COVID-19. There's more of a chance for that exponential growth of, growth of the virus inside of your body. So, uh, you know, in, in movies, you'll kind of have the image of the tick, tick, tick. Uh, minor exposures aren't really enough typically to get you sick. Um, so, but if you walk into a little break room like we had at Endo, where it's closed in on three sides and there's a low roof, and that's where people are sitting down and taking off their masks to eat, uh, after we learned about air-to-air -air transmission, we realized that was not a tenable situation anymore. Uh, so we identified that as a stagnant airspace, and we thought about, well, okay, how can we increase the air turnover? So uh, there's an exhaust fan right there uh, next to the break room. Uh, we're running that exhaust fan uh, actually uh, pretty much continuously these days. And there was a, a, a door in the back of that break room that uh, was typically sealed shut uh, because it wasn't used uh, for a human transit. But we actually have taken that door off of the hinges. Uh, so we get lots of airflow through now that break room. So what was once a stagnant airspace is now a very well ventilated space and the people that are going to be taking a break in that space are going to be dramatically safer than they were before. Using air filters is also a good idea. Uh, probably not quite as effective as a really well ventilated space where the air is just getting sucked out, uh, but there are a number of HEPA air filters that will suck the viral particles out of the space. A great place to use an air filter might be in somebody's office. So I have an air filter in my office when I go in and I'm working uh, at the facility. I'm turning on that air filter because I don't want anybody sticking their head in my office uh, and uh, to talk to me. And maybe I've been exhaling and maybe I'm asymptomatic. I don't even know I have COVID-19 and the viral particles are building up in my office over time. I don't want that to happen. So the air filter is a great way to do to help reduce that. Um, 
there's no great uh, rule yet. I've been doing some research, but nobody's come up with a great rule of thumb to tell you, you know, how risky uh, dead air space is. But you, you know, a great idea is to minimize the human uh, human minutes spent in dead air spaces. There's probably some formula which is like the number of human minutes in a space divided by the volume of the space divided by the air turnover in the space, and below that threshold you're probably safe, and above it you're probably not. I haven't seen any formula like that yet, but I'm looking for one, and hopefully we can find it and incorporate it into clean practice. Um, it's important to train people about aerosolization and viral buildup. A lot of people don't know that uh, the bigger the intensity of your exposure, the more risk you have of getting sick. Everybody in your organization needs to understand that uh, and understand needs to understand the phenomenon of aerosolization. Laughing is a great way to aerosolize. <laughs> Uh, the virus, uh, it turns out. So, um, you know, making sure that people are wearing masks as long as possible, even when they're on break. Um, I have to tell you, you know, I, I um, during over the course of this crisis, you know, I've gone back to endo and sometimes I've seen some backsliding on some of the practices we've put in place. It's really important to refresh your team. Uh, but, um, you know, people were taking off their masks as soon as they went on break. And then they were, uh, you know, then getting their food prepared and getting together uh, their food and then sitting down and talking. And that was actually uh, not as safe as it, as it really needed to be. And so we've emphasized that people need to wear their masks right up to the moment when they're eating, uh, even when they're socially distant, uh, as a way to really further uh, minimize the risks there. So airflow management is the new frontier of COVID-19. Uh, everybody has to be thinking about it. And if you haven't um, you know, if you've already put in place some other good practices, but not really thought comprehensive about airflow, it's time to do another gimbal walk in your facility and go through the space thinking about this issue and how you can keep people safe. Start today. Time is of the essence. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, are there any questions? Oh, UV light cleaning and other uh, periodic cleaning methods. I'm going to look at this chat. Yes, so um, the disinfectant methods, um, you know, we definitely recommend when you're doing surface cleaning, there's certain uh, cleaners that are recommended to be used. Uh, peroxide sprays or disinfectant sprays, you need to make sure that they are uh, really certified uh, to uh, kill uh, viral particles. Uh, Robert asked about UV light cleaning. That is not something that I have developed enough expertise to talk about uh, confidently today. It's something that I'm looking into. I know that certain HVAC systems are looking in, you know, you can actually install UV um, lights uh, in the intake area for the air or in the HVAC system uh, to actually uh, kill the uh, COVID-19 uh, particles as they move through your HVAC system. Uh, that is an area that I think is very much part of something that we need to explore, uh, but I don't feel I can speak really authoritatively on that at this point. In fact, you know, often with um, HVAC systems, it's probably going to be a good idea, depending on the size and complexity of your of your space, it may be a good idea to bring in, and you know, your HVAC uh, contractor to talk about this issue with them. Uh, you may need to upgrade the filters on your HVAC system to be good enough to remove viral particles. Uh, that may be something that you can do really quickly that would in increase the safety of your team. So good question. Um, it's good to have, uh, as Robert mentions, multiple methods to try to uh, protect your team. Thank you very much, Robert, for the feedback. Um, and I will share out the recorded video. Uh, we are looking to partner with other organizations. We've recently partnered with a safety supply company to do a uh, webinar for their team. We also did a webinar for a greater uh, a business association here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we think that's the best way for us to connect with uh, lots of people is to do it uh, via webinars that uh, organizations uh, organize for us. Uh, we are uh, having other types of um, uh, opportunities to 
uh, have dialogue with other uh, organizations that are also struggling. We're organizing a coffee that's going to happen in September. I believe the date is September 10th, Maria. Uh, and the time is 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Is that also correct? Uh, so we will, uh, but we'll have information on that uh, on our website. So be sure to visit cleanpractice.org uh, slash webinars uh, for the latest webinar that we'll be having. Um, we uh, are anxious to share this because we really think it not only is important for people's safety, but it can be really helpful for organizations to keep moving forward proactively uh, to achieve their missions at a very difficult time when a lot of people are, are very challenged. So with that, I'm going to thank everybody for joining us today and uh, say um, good luck, be safe, uh, and share uh, good practices with your friends and colleagues and connect them with us if you think that we can be helpful to them. All right. Goodbye, everybody. With that, I'm going to end the webinar and enjoy the rest of your day.